2 Peter chapter 2. In fact, uh, the first chapter, we talked about Peter's tabernacle and the fact that the Lord had told him he was going to be leaving. The second chapter, Peter's kind of getting in the same vein as the book of Jude. He's talking about false teachers, talking about things in the end time. And then when we get into the third chapter, which probably will be next Sunday night, uh, he gets into the, the, the day of God, the, the millennium, the, the, the dissolving of planet earth. And so it's quite interesting. His approach to the end times is much different than Paul's approach. But we have to understand, too, that Peter wasn't looking for the rapture, wasn't looking for the catching away, because he knew on the words of Jesus Christ that he was going to die. And so he looked at it a little bit different. Anyway, we're going to begin reading with the first verse of Second Peter. And it says, But there were false prophets among the people. Now, let me say this real quickly. When he says there were false prophets among the people, the people here is Israel. It's not the church. The people is Israel. A false prophet would be easily detected in our day simply because they had prophesied and it wouldn't come to pass. I mean, be pretty quick to figure out who's a nut and who ain't as far as, as, far as people try to prophesy. But notice he, he, he switches it from saying false prophets. And notice it says, even as there shall be false teachers. And he's speaking to the church among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, there's a few words I want to point out uh, before we go any further. And I want to point out, first of all, this word privily means personal presence, or it means to have a self-ego. They, they get around in privacy. They they're kind of in seclusion. They kind of, uh, they're real sneaky. They're sneaky snakes is basically what that is. Privately, they come in with an ego, ego of themselves and personal presence. They get around different people. And it says, they shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, uh, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, uh, the word heresy there means to... Uh, their opinion of doctrines, the way that they think it should be. Uh, the heresies there, in fact, would refer to something that is so dangerous and so in, inflammatory that it would destroy lives. And their heresies would be bringing in false doctrine, bringing in a, a something contrary to the scriptures. Uh, I'll give you a heresy that they had in those days. And in fact, we have a whole denomination that has the same heresy in our day, that they taught that when Jesus Christ arose from the grave, he did not come up bodily. He only came up spirit. And that is a heresy because Jesus came out of the body physically and spiritually. He did not just come out of the grave spirit. And that is a heresy because the teaching of the Bible is very clear that the same body that Jesus died in on the cross arose from the grave. And they had all kinds of heresies like they were already in the great tribulation. They were already uh, uh, in, in, in uh, different uh, aspects. And in fact, one teaching they had was that they taught that no one could really sin anymore. Uh, when you got born again, then no one could ever sin anymore. Once you're born again, you could not possibly sin anymore. But if you did sin, that's the flesh responsibility. That's not the spirit's responsibility. And by the way, not too far from here, there's a church that teach that. That if you do wrong in the flesh, it doesn't matter because the spirit is sanctified and that's what's saved. And that's also another heresy. Teachers coming in teaching that. They're not, they're not prophesying like false prophets. They're teachers. And so I'm talking tonight about false teachers. And Peter uh, gives us the, the thing, um, the warning that in these last days, and but, but, uh, as he's getting ready to leave, and go to be with the Lord. He says, you beware of these apostates. Uh, and he talks about apostates. And false teachers, uh, they come in undercover, according to the word privily, with their heresies. And they bring upon them swift destruction. Verse 2 says, and many shall follow their perni uh, pernicious ways. 
Now the word pernicious means violent and deadly and very serious or bring serious deadly injury. Pernicious means to bring great havoc, violent, just, it's just a violent devastation. But many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. They'll, and he talks about how they speak of the truth evil uh, uh, later on here in, in this chapter too. And uh, then it goes on to say in verse 3, And through covetousness, and everybody of course knows what covetousness, that's greed, things they want, things they're trying to draw attention, whether it be pride or things or riches or whatever the case may be their ego and their desire to be worshipped in some form or shape or fashion, these false teachers. And through covetousness shall they with framed words make merchandise of you. That sounds almost like a television broadcast, isn't it, on, on some kind of TV station. You send this and send that and we'll send you a, a two cent bottle of water that come from the tab and we'll say it's from Jordan. But anyway, it's <laughs> Framed words, and it talks about make merchandise of you. In other words, they don't care about you. They just want your money. They want your accolades. They want your attention. They, want you. they don't care about you. And a true shepherd cares about you. And a, a real shepherd of the church cares about his flock. And it says, they make merchandise of you whose judgment now a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So he's just saying God's going to get them and get them good. Let's look at the word framed words. Framed words. Let's explain what framed words means. It means not real, pretend, and made up words. It could be counterfeit, counterfeit tales, false stories, pretending facts that are not facts, lies about miracles and so-called legends. That word framed words actually goes into the, uh, into the illustration that a frame word would be like molding. I looked it up in the, the, uh, the Greek and it, it means to mold, to bend the words to fit what they want to say. It's kind of like uh, plastic words. You just kind of, you know, you can make a cup of, of plastic, you can make, out of plastic, you can make a bumper on a car or whatever, you know. Plastic makes different shapes. And, and that frame means kind of plastic, artificial, um, made up. And these, pre, these teachers will come in and they'll use frame words and make merchandise of you. And then he gives examples. There are three examples through verse 4, 5, and 6 of the apostate or false teachers in the past. And, of course, in the past he identifies them as false prophets now he says the false prophet isn't a great issue. The issue now is false teachers in the church because they come in and they're so subtle and they can bring such terrible havoc on the church. Verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Notice he's talking about the angels here. And this is one of the examples. There's three examples of the apostates in the past, and he gives three of them. The first one is the angels that fell. The next one is Noah's world uh, in, in which he lived. And, the, and that's the second one, Noah's world. And the third one is Sodom and Gomorrah. And he shares those three. It almost looks like he copied the book of Jude because Jude says they're pretty much the same thing. But I'll show you some changes that he made by the Holy Ghost when he wrote it that's different than what Jude had said. Now verse four, uh, verse four, he says, God spared not the angels. And he's trying to say, God's not gonna spare these false teachers either. He's not, you know, just like he brought judgment on the angels and Noah's world and, and Sodom and Gomorrah, he's gonna bring judgment on these false teachers. And he says, it's gonna come sooner than they realize. And he says uh, uh, in verse four, for God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered him into dark, uh, chains of darkness to be reserved unto the judgment. Now, I always had a problem. Well, not a problem. I always had a, you know, I, I like to dissect things. I like to say, why is he saying this? And, and so I, I want to share some thoughts about how do you put a chain on a, 
on an angel? I mean, really, <laughs> how do you put an angel in, in, in a prison? What is he talking about? You said, well, the scripture says he uses the word that he uh, took them down into hell, down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness. He didn't say chains. He said chains of darkness. So the binding power is not chains like we think of chains. It is darkness. And so the darkness, they are in darkness to be reserved until the day of judgment. Now, if you'll read carefully and study and go back to the book of Jude and look at some of the, um, the uh, uh, studies in the Greek and so forth in Hebrew, when he talks about hell, many times he's talking about casting them down into pits or deep caverns, dark places. And I believe that there is nothing more paralyzing than total darkness. I went down to Kentucky, uh, Judy and I and, and the family, we went to Kentucky just for a break to get away from this church for a little bit. And we went down and, and they took it. We went down into Mammoth Cave. Anybody been in the Mammoth Cave? Okay. Uh, they take you down there and it winds around. And I think they said the network's like 300 miles in different directions. But you go way down. I don't know how many miles we went down under, but we went way down low. And they took us down. In fact, I went through places where I had to suck in my belly to get through. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, if I was any fatter, I would, I'd get stuck right here. Anybody ever went through them little places? Yeah, you remember them, don't you? And then they take them down, and of course they have it lit up and the lights. And they take us down about one and a half, two miles down under, and they turn every light out. You can't even scratch your nose. It is so dark. You can't find your hand to find the other hand. And I really believe that this darkness is not just darkness in, in the area of lack of knowledge because we know angels have knowledge. I think this darkness is literal darkness that are on these angels and they can't move. And I believe there's an angel in the great Euphrates River somewhere deep below in the darkness. He can't move. Darkness will paralyze you. I went into the fan, uh, Fantastic Caverns. I may have been in it. Amen. And it was more enjoyable because I had to walk in the other one. Fantastic Cavern, we rode in it. But they got out there, in the, way out there in Fantastic Caverns. They turned the lights out. And, and the person, I think it was a woman, I'm not sure, was giving us the tour. And they said that years ago that they'd go in there and they would get this... Uh, sulfur or something, some mineral out of there, and they'd use it for uh, gunpowder to fight in the Civil War. And they said that it, there was times, and they also said that at Mammoth Cave as well, but I remember in detail what she said at Fantastic Cavern. Anyway, they said sometimes they would get in there and their lamps would burn out. And they had no way to light their lamp. And you know what? They'd starve in there. Because they could not find food, they could not find water, they couldn't even find their nose. They couldn't find their hand. They just walk around, bump against the rocks and just walk around, just in total darkness, couldn't move. Darkness is paralyzing. And I don't know exactly where all them angels are, but some of them angels are down in the darkness, down in the pits and the caverns. And that's what Peter's talking about. They're way down and God judged them and put them in dark places where they are paralyzed in chains of darkness, and reserved unto judgment. Then he gives the second illustration of apostate. And you say, well, how could angels be an apostate? Well, they rebelled against God. Lucifer rose up and said, I'll be like the most high God, and he got other angels to go with him. That was dumb, dumb, da dumb, dumb, right? But he still did it. And I think, I think that, that uh, initial rebellion of Lucifer and the angels is what spurred this angels being in chains of darkness. I think there was a continual rebellion of the angels that lasted, I don't know how long, maybe thousands of years. I don't know. Anyway, it lasted a long time. And some of them angels were not put in chains of darkness. Some of them angels roam the earth today and they're called devils in the King James and they are demons. And that's why they make such a mess in the world. And they are apostate. And then demons get in false teachers, and then you've got a real bad mess on your hands. 
Then he talks about Noah, and this is the second illustration of the apostate uh, in, the, in the past. And he says, Noah's world. Uh, look at this verse five, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood, or bring, yeah, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, somebody got really mad at me one time because I preached about Noah preaching in 120 years. And I just preached, and I thought I was waxing pretty eloquent about Noah preaching for 120 years. And somebody got mad at me and told some people in the church, it don't say in the Bible anywhere that Noah preached. Well, it says right there he did. And I don't think that it was just a hammer making noise. I think Noah spoke up and told people that there was coming a flood, there was coming a judgment. And you'll find that also in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. I didn't write it down, but it talks about him being warned of God, moved with fear to the saving of his house, preparing an ark, and so forth. Well, in fact, we're going to be into that in the preaching here after a while. But anyway, Noah's uh, was a time. Um, what about Noah? The, earth, the, the scripture says in the sixth chapter of Genesis and seventh chapter, the earth was filled with violence. Well, that sounds like our day. Uh, it says that every imagination of man's heart, mind and heart was evilly, evil continually. That sounds like our day. And so in that, that, that rebellion of Noah, or in the people of not Noah, but in the Noah's day, the people, they were apostate in the fact that they didn't want God, they didn't need God, they had nothing to do with God. And, and Beverly, that's in Genesis chapter six and seven where it talks about violence on, on the earth and there was wickedness everywhere. And uh, so Noah's world was apostate. Violence everywhere, no regard for life, no regard for God. Now what's interesting about Noah Jesus Christ said, as the days of Noah were, so shall it be when the coming of the Lord is. And, and, and Genesis talks about the wickedness of Noah, the pe not Noah, but the wickedness of the people that lived in Noah's day. But Jesus don't really talk about the wickedness. He just says, as the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, taking in marriage, and they knew not till the flood came. So I took by that, Jesus was saying, it's just as bad to ignore God as it is to fight God. It's just as bad to ignore God and say I don't need God as it is to get out there and, and fight and so forth. Now, it's not just as bad for me because it affects me when people are wicked and evil. But God will judge people that uh, have the mentality they have no need for God. Uh, in fact, um, the flood was before the law of Moses, right? How many would agree that the flood was before the law of Moses? How many would you, how many would you agree that... Because the flood was before the law of Moses, the Bible says in Genesis 6 and 7 that they were shedding blood. They had, no, they had no regard for life. Did you know that God commanded capital punishment after Noah came off the ark? He really did. Now, these guys that's going around saying, oh, you don't have capital punishment. It's not of God, blah, blah, blah. Let me, let me, uh, let me show you in Genesis 9 verse 6. This is before the law. This is after Noah comes off the ark. Remember the people in, in Noah's day was horrifically bad. And next time someone says they don't believe in capital punishment to you, and maybe you don't believe in it. And if you don't believe in it, I'm gonna stick this in your ear, this verse. And I want you to listen to it because there's what God said in, when Noah came off the ark. God says to him in Genesis 9, 6, God commanded Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man, not by God, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made man, or God made man, in the image God made man. That's Genesis 9 verse 6. That is capital punishment before the law of Moses. You say, well, where is it in the New Testament? Well, it's in Romans chapter 13 that the government... Those that bring judgment and, and discipline on the earth do not yield the sword in vain. It's in that God ordains these principles and powers and so forth. And so I don't want to see anybody killed. I don't want to see anybody put in a gas chamber. I don't want to see anybody in an electric chair. I don't want to see anybody uh, put to death for a murder they committed. 
But you know, we owe it to God because these people kill somebody made in the image of God. It, it ain't a matter of, oh, God wouldn't do that. God said that we were to take vengeance on those that kill people because people are not made, you know, animals are not made in the image of God, but man is made in the image of God. So it's a very serious offense to God for another individual to kill another individual. Then he gives the, the third apostate, and it is Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, verse 6 says that, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them that were uh, with overthrow. In other words, God condemned them with overthrow. He burned Sodom and Gomorrah, making them an example to those that after should live ungodly. What does God call homosexuality? Ungodly. What does God call bestiality? Ungodly. What does God call sodomy? Ungodly. And Jude talks about ungodly, 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 ungodly. And notice he says that there was a guy down, verse 7, in Sodom and Gomorrah, by the name of Lot, verse 7, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, parentheses, for that righteous man, speaking a lot, dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now the whole illustration here, or the, the whole message here, is basically saying that God knows how to deliver them. That's the message that Peter's trying to get. God knows how to deliver Lot. He knows how to deliver them that are vexed with, with uh, the filthy conversation of the wicked. But Sodom and Gomorrah, sinful flesh had gone mad. It was out of control. I had someone say, oh, it's been, I don't remember when it was, but somebody said they thought Lot was a wonderful Christian man. Well, according to this scripture, he was a Christian man. He did, he wasn't Christian man as we know, but he, he, he did have a fear of God like his uncle Abraham, according to this scripture, he, he went to heaven. But you don't find him in Hebrews chapter 11. And you will not find it said, by faith Lot entered into Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not there. But you will find that by faith Abraham went out knowing not where he was going, looking for a, a city whose builder and maker is gone. And so Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of flesh out of control. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, uh, Peter paints a whole picture, uh, and he's saying God knows how to get Lot out. He knows how to deliver just Lot, verse 6. And so it's understanding, verse 9 says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Now, in defense of someone that might say, or maybe in, uh, what would I call it, apologetics, I'm going to fuss with you. If you think Lot was a wonderful Christian, yeah, he was so wonderful, he lost his wife. He was so wonderful, he lost everything he had, and so wonderful, he ended up having uh, incest with his daughters. He was so wonderful that God had to drag him out of the city before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. No, it ain't Lot was so wonderful, it was God was so wonderful. And Abraham was so wonderful to intercede for him and pray for him. Lot was not wonderful. Abraham was wonderful. And God was wonderful to spare Lot. And now Lot was a righteous man, the scripture says, and I can't argue with that. But the book of Jude talks about these things. And, and uh, I'll give you some comparison in a little bit. Verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government presumptuous Presumptuous, that means arrogant, overbearing people. Presumptuous, overbearing, arrogant. Presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignity, dignities. Now he, gives, he goes on in, in verse um, 11 about, whereas the angels are greater in power and might bring not a radiant accusation against them before the Lord. Jude 9 Verse 9 in Jude, it says, Michael would not bring a railing accusation against a Satan, disputing over the body of Moses, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Now, 
I want you to listen to me because this is something people miss. When he's talking about dignitaries and he's talking about principalities and people, basically and primarily he's talking about spiritual principalities. Should we talk ugly about our president? No, sir, we should pray for our president. He needs to be born again. He needs to get saved. Should we be ugly and hateful? No, but we can be opinionated, which I am, but I do respect the office. And I do respect, but here it goes much more deeper than just respecting men on earth that are in authority. He's going about spiritual principalities. Look at verse 12. But these are brute beasts um, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, that can be people, false teachers, but also uh, fallen angels. Verse 13, and we shall, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Did you catch what I just read? To riot in the daytime. Verse 13, they're unrighteous as they that count it a pleasure to riot in the daytime. That means false teachers will come right out in church. People will come right out in broad daylight now and flaunt their sin. And he says, spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. That means they come to your church potlucks. That means they come to your church services. That means they catch you in the back foyer and say, let me tell you something about the pastor. Let me tell you something about, let me, let me tell you to go to a certain website and look up this and all of that. And, and folks, let me tell you, nothing wrong with telling people to go to a certain website. But what we have to understand is sometimes people are trying to pull people away. Having eyes full of adultery. Now, cannot cease from sin. Now, eyes full of adultery could mean more than just sexual perversion, although I think adultery is definitely sexual perversion. But, but having eyes full of adultery means that a man or a woman sees somebody else and they undress them in their mind or they fantasize sexually with other people or maybe they go further than that and try to hit on somebody, try to, try to lure somebody into uh, sexual things or betray their, their spouse or whatever the case may be. That The Bible says that these false teachers have eyes full of adultery. In other words, they're constantly thinking about filthy, ungodly things and sexual uh, filth. And it's not just sex, but other things as well. Beguiling unstable souls. Now, that's talking about sex and that's talking about people that will take advantage of someone that isn't real strong spiritually. They will seduce them. At heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way, notice the term, the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, I want to point out something about, about Balaam. And I wrote this down. I want to get it right. And I want you to listen carefully because it's real important that you, don't, that you don't miss this. Verse 15, he talks about the way of Balaam. And he gone astray. So here in verse 15 of 2 Peter 2, we find the way of Balaam, which was greed, which was covetous, which was greed pretending to be on the Lord's side and all the other time not living for the Lord because he wanted something out of Israel, wanted something out of uh, Balak, the other king. Jude doesn't say the way of, of uh, Balaam. Jude in verse 11 says, the error of Balaam, the error of Balaam. And the error is they play both sides. They pretend to be on the Lord's side, and when they're with somebody else, they're on their side. You ever met people like that? They're on whoever side they're with at the time. And that's the way Balaam was. So Jude says it's the error of Balaam. Peter says it's the way of Balaam, which is greed. But the book of Revelation says it's the doctrine of Balaam. 
verse 14 of Revelation 2, these false teachers will sinfully practice teaching people contrary to the doctrines of God. And they will teach things that will lead people into false believing and false things, doctrine of Balaam. Revelation warns about the doctrine of Balaam. Well, what did Balaam do? Well, Balaam went to the Moabite and the king Balak, and he went to, and, and Balak wanted uh, Balaam to bless him and curse Israel. And Balaam said, I can't do that, but I'd really like to have your silver. I'd really like to have your, 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 your prestige. I'd really like to, you know, I, I'd like to be on your side. And so he plays around. And he kept asking the Lord, let me do this, let me do this, let me do it. And God says, no, 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 no. Have you ever stopped to think that maybe God says no, 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 no. And then finally says, okay, go ahead. You've nagged me, you've pushed me, and now you're going to pay the price. That's actually what happened to Balaam. And so Balaam told the the uh, Moabites, this is how you get Israel. This is how you're going to curse Israel. You give them pretty women. I don't sound like a curse. All the young men would love that, a pretty woman. But guess what? He said, you take all the most beautiful women in Moab, the Moabite women, and you put them with the young men of Israel. And when they get together, an unequally yoked union, they'll start worshiping false gods. And they'll start going different directions and they'll get into false doctrine. And that's exactly what Revelation chapter 2 is talking about, verse 14. Teaching them to fornicate, commit adultery, to get into doctrines that should not get into. Now, in that, you see the difference between Jude and, and Peter and, and the book of Revelation. So it shows Balaam as the way of Balaam, which is uh, in verse 15 of 2 Peter. The era of Balaam, verse 11 of Jude. And the doctrine of Balaam, Revelation 2, verse 14. Now, we'll read on a little bit. And uh, I, I believe with all my heart that verse 16, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Oh, preacher, you're using bad language. I'm talking about an animal. <laughs> but it says, but was rebuked of his iniquity by dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. In other words, the angel stood before the dumb ass and wouldn't allow him to go through with the flaming sword and Balaam didn't see it. And then finally when Balaam beat the, the, the mule or beat the donkey, then the donkey says, why are you beating me for? I'm trying to save your, your sorry, no good life. Amen. Verse 17, these are wells without water. He's speaking about these false teachers again. Wells without water. Clouds, they are carried with a tempest. Now, you know, I used to think, well, that's just talking about clouds and, you know, the storm coming up. No, no, no. These false teachers love to perform in strifeful places. These false teachers love to get involved in stormy areas, tempest areas. They'll prey on someone going through a hard time. They'll, they'll and I'm going to share something that's going to blow your mind, and we might even get some conversation about it when I get done, because Paul talks about this thing. But anyway, it says they are clouds without water, wells without water. That's pretty sad, pumping mud or dirt. Clouds without, carried with a tempest to whom the mist of the darkness is reserved forever. In other words, they're going to darkness. It's going to fall apart. And all that they do will come to naught. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh through much wantingness. In other words, people are wanting, they're needing, and these guys promise these things, these false teachers. They use frame words. And those that were clean escaped uh, from them who live in error. In other words, he, they come and find those that are clean. Those that were, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. And they suck them back into error. They suck them back into the filth. Verse 19, while they promised them liberty, 
They themselves are the servants of corruption. Well, they promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, they again are entangled therein, are overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now, let me stop here for a minute and clear my throat because some will say, well, right there shows you that people, preachers that are born again, saved, can go the wrong way and end up going to hell. I'm not here to argue that at all. I am here to tell you that people can know the Word of God and still not be redeemed. And a person that knows the Word of God and knows the plan of God, whether they backslid or whether they just know the Word of God, that is the most dangerous human being that walks on planet Earth because they have ballistic power. They have atomic power. They have nuclear power. It's called the Word of God. And whether they're saved or lost, they can use those words to cut people in pieces. It is my personal opinion that if a person that is that has been saved and loves God and, and then they, they've escaped the cares of the world, escaped the things of the world, and not everybody's gonna agree with what I'm about to say, but it's my personal belief that if a false prophet gets in or a false teacher gets, and they once were walking with God, they ain't got no place to go but hell. I mean, that's just the bottom line. They have no place to go but hell. Now, you can believe in your eternal security and all that, but I'm just here to tell you that's pretty stout words here. And uh, we can disagree if you want to do that, but I, I just think really with all my heart that this second chapter ought to be very scary to anyone that claims to be a child of God that will fool around with God's will and God's plan. Verse 21, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now, I don't know how to explain this, so I'm just going to say it. If someone knows the word, they're full of the spirit of God, they're walking in, and they, they turn their back on God, and now they walk in the flesh instead of the spirit, there is a mutation that takes place in their life. A mutation is something that's not human. A mutation is something that's main, mingled. And if there's a mingled spirit that's mutated with the flesh, they are very, very dangerous to society. Because they, they mutated and they're not, they're not living for God and they're not serving God and they're using the word of God to destroy and, and, and tear down lives. We're living in such a day as that today. Mutation. People hang on to the word of God and then they, they hang on to the, the things of the flesh and then they mutate. And that's horrible, but it, that's exactly what happens. Um, verse 22, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire now that's Proverbs 26 verse 11 where it talks about the dog returning to his own vomit the true proverb the dog turned to his own vomit as a backslider the more you know about the Bible, the more dangerous and corrupt you can become. The most dangerous person on planet Earth is someone that is using God to destroy other people's lives. And now they can't actually use God, but they take God's word and they twist it and frame words and they cause terrible, terrible problems. Now, the uh, Bible says the dog returns to his own vomit. Sal returns to her while in the mire. So we, I'll, give, I'll give our Baptist friends the benefit of the doubt. Once a dog, always a dog. If you change from a dog to a sheep, you ain't gonna stay back to the vomit. Sheep don't drink vomit. And I, you know, the prodigal son, if he had died over there in the far country, he'd still died a son, not a pig. So, you know, I, I have, I understand that sin is exceedingly sinful, but I, I have to tell you that to read this chapter two of Second Peter as a preacher, I've got to tremble in my shoes because this is very, very strong language that Peter is making. And so I'm not here to try to tell you I know all the information, but 
Uh, I am going to share something with you that's going to raise your eyebrows a little bit. Did you know Paul talked about these false teachers coming into the church in Corinthians? And Paul basically was saying that God will use these false teachers, these radical, ridiculous things that people bring into the church, to pull, to pull the phonies out of church. You say, I don't believe that. Let me read something to you. Because I do believe that God will allow cuckoos to come in, try to fill the church, seduce people, and, and that's why I'm teaching, because I, we have a strong church, and that's not apt to happen. But uh, anyone that can be taken out of this church and taken to Catholic is not... I mean, there, there's a sifting there. Anyone that can be taken out of this church or any church to Jehovah's Witness... Uh, Kingdom Hall, there's a sifting there. And anyone that's taken from any church that believes the Bible, believes the Word of God, and is sucked out of the church into uh, Kingdom uh, Hall or, or uh, Catholicism or anything like that, they didn't have the goods to begin with or they wouldn't be shaken out. Now, isn't that hard? But it's true. So let me make that statement again. I want you to listen very carefully. God will use faults, the faults, and the ridiculous things to pull the phonies out of his church. If they're phonies, they're phonies. And he'll use these ridiculous things to pull people out. And in that way, he's, he's blowing the chaff away. <sighs> he's cleansing his church through allowing these people to come in and pull people out. I'm not talking about real believers. That's what my job is to make sure that don't happen. But, you know, uh, there's no cure for stupid. And if people want to be stupid, there's no cure for stupid. Stupid is stupid, that's stupid. Right? You say, preacher, I don't like your teaching. Okay. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, and I'll show you how God will use the false and the ridiculous things to pull the phonies out of his church. Listen to the wording of this, and when I read this, it just blew me away. I've read 1 Corinthians hundreds of times, but when I read this, I went back and looked at it and said, wow. Trouble was in Corinthians, and Paul is addressing trouble. And here's what he says in verse 19 of chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. For there must be also, there must be, did you see that? There must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be manifest among you. He's saying in so many words, if somebody blows through this church and they drag people out, it's a clear indication that the people they drag out is not what they appeared to be. In other words, the true colors will sooner or later come out and they will be revealed. And that's what Peter's saying. And that's what Apostle Paul is saying. And so, you know, I, I do believe with all my heart that we're living in a day of false teachers. And I'll say this again, false prophets don't mess with me a whole lot because the false prophet's gonna take care of people after the rapture. Remember, the false prophet's gonna deceive the nations and after the rapture, the false prophet's gonna come along. And Jesus said they were false prophets in Israel, false prophets. But now I'm more concerned with the false teachers because you see, Jesus laid down a foundation and the teachers are gonna to try to erode at that foundation. False prophets come along and say, thus saith the Lord, you know, uh, the Golden Gate's going to uh, collapse in, in this year. Or thus saith the Lord, the, the, the uh, Golden Arch in St. Louis is going to turn purple next year. Well, we'll just wait around and see if they, it does. And if it doesn't happen, they're false prophets. Someone makes excuses. I had someone make an excuse. Well, you know, you're trying to do what God tells you to do. You're working in the office of prophet, but you're not always going to get it right. Zip it and know you're hearing from God. Because getting it wrong one time is one time too many that will destroy somebody's life. 
And so it don't take long to figure out a false prophet. They'll be seen quick enough. But it's these false teachers that Peter's trying to say is very, very dangerous. And so Peter's getting ready to leave, and then he's going to get into some chapter 3, into some awesome, incredible lessons about, about the end time and the coming of the Lord and the new age and the new day and the new world to come and all that. And it'll be awesome. But right here he was talking about false teachers. You know why we have pastor study? So everybody... We don't necessarily have to agree on everything, but we do have to agree on what's right. I mean, what's essential. And I never did say that I know everything, but I do know this book. I don't know everything in this book, but I know this book. And I'm sure that I've said things that, that maybe isn't correct. I don't know that I have because I wouldn't have said it if I didn't think it was correct. All right? But false teachers deliberately and on purpose twist with framed words to prove their point and to make merchandise of God's people. False teachers know better. They know the truth. But they twist it and make framed words and plastic words and artificial words and phony imitations because they want the money out of your pocket. They want the prestige. Well, there he is. In fact, Paul said, don't, let, don't be many teachers. Paul warned, don't be many teachers. Because he's trying to say that's a grave responsibility. Don't be many teachers. Don't be many preachers. That's a grave responsibility. Because God's going to judge all of us preachers and teachers in the church. God's going to judge us with a stricter standard than he does others. So I don't believe that. <laughs> you just wait till judgment and I'll say, I told you so. I'm just being honest. Uh, let me say this. Sometimes people get on our platform and they sing. And as far as I'm concerned, Brother Terry is a, a holy man of God. And the people that sing on our, church, uh, on our platform are holy people. So I'm not referring to anything. But over the 21 years, we've had people sing on our platform that probably wasn't exactly right with God. I'm just being honest. Most of the people that sing in our church now, we've got good quality stuff, and uh, we're not, we don't have a bunch of phonies on the platform singing, and I thank God for that, but we, you know, in 21 years, there's been people come and sing. I don't have as strict as standards for guitar players, uh, drummers, piano players. I mean, if that were the case, Judy would be in trouble, my wife, piano player. But anyway, I don't have, I don't have strict standards for all the singers, because the Bible says, everything that had breath is to praise the Lord, the last verse in Psalms. So I'm not saying there's a different standard for people that sing. Now, I'm not saying, I think everybody that sings now in this church is right with God. They love the Lord. Let me repeat that. Right with God, love the Lord. And I'm not making light of anything. But I am saying that there are times when people, I think, get on the platform and sing. And they really, you know, they, they, they sing. And they're not really singing from the heart. They just want people to hear them. And that happens. Are you listening? And I don't have as high standards for singers, or musicians, but I have a lot higher standards for preachers. Are you listening? I have a lot higher standards for preachers. I don't have a preacher get behind this pulpit that I don't think is living right. I believe they're living for God. Or they wouldn't be up there. Amen? And there are some people that get behind the pulpit and, you know, the, we got our apostolic folks that believe you can't have short sleeves. I mean, come on, that's wicked. Yeah, Lenny, you're sinning. Your, your arms are showing. Jeanette, you're sinning. You don't have long sleeves. And there are churches that teach that you got to be covered up from the chin all the way down to your feet. You can't have a, a, a slit in your dress. Or men, you can have a slit in your dress either. And, and, and you know, they teach that. And, and I got, you know, that they would think our church is horrible because someone would teach with short sleeves on. Look at Ed back there, he's short sleeve. I just got one way to, I just got one thing to say. Amendment two, I have the right to bear arms. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, 
one of you can come and get a mic and we'll take, see if anybody wants to say something or make a comment. And uh, been a good lesson. And uh, I know I said some things that maybe you wouldn't totally agree with, but isn't it good to get the word and say, hey, you know, there's, that chapter is a lot more alive than I seen it in the past and I learned. Just push it straight up, Jerry. It'll catch up. It takes a while. That mic takes a while to catch its breath. Just push it. Just push it straight up. Yeah, push it straight. Push it straight up. You got it. You got it right. It takes a while to get its breath. Anybody have a question, comment before we, Beverly, before we change our service tonight? Kind of stupid, but uh, just dawned on me that uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah happened before the flood. Did uh, it? After. After, after the after. flood? Sodom and Gomorrah was after the flood. But that was in Abraham's day. Yeah, well, that's what I thought it happened after, but I was taking it. Here that it ha happened before the flood. No, no. He gives illustrations of the angels, which is before the world that we know. Then he uses the illustration of the, the flood before uh, of people, before this world. And then he gives the illustration of Sodom and Gomorrah for this life, this world we live in now. now so in, in verse 5 it says, And spared not the old world. So that means the world before the flood, the old world. Yes. Yes. And then after the flood, was it all new and different? Yeah, then? after the flood is this world. The one we're yeah, living in now is after the flood. Yeah. And that's when Sodom and Gomorrah did their thing. And that's now when Sodom and Gomorrah, the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah is rising up today in our land, in, in the world. And the, uh, I have a Jimmy Swigert Bible, but excuse me, but in verse four, do you believe that these fallen angels cohabited with women and had uh, uh, giants? Well, Jimmy Swaggart says yes, but I disagree. And you the reason I disagree is if they did it, they'd still be doing it. It would be in the genes. Actually, angels would still be in the genes of people lineage after the flood because they weren't destroyed. And there was giants and the sons of Anak were giants and there were giants in David and Goliath stage. So no, I don't believe angels, I don't believe angels ever were able to perform sexual relationships with women. They may have done something far, far worse, but I don't believe that they, they procreate. Each angel is created by God individually and they don't procreate. So I disagree with, I respectfully disagree with Jimmy Swagger on that. Anybody else? I got, I got something I want to say referred back to Lot and the wife was discussing this the other day about him being vexed in that situation he was in. Don't we put ourselves in a position sometimes to get ahead of what God wants in our lives? Like he was, it had to be the lust of his eyes looking the direction he went. Sure it was. He probably got ahead of what, so sure, sure I did. give a put blame a lot part of that, you know, but I'm, I'm wondering if our lives, we don't do that. I give a real small illustration with me and her. We were going to move from one place to another one time, and we looked at this house, well, we decided we liked it, so we bought the place, but one long after that, we started getting vexed with the neighbor's dogs that barked it up. I told her, I said, we put ourselves in that situation. Why you keep, you know, I'll just use that for a little Well, this world, honestly, this world would be a great place to live if it wasn't for people. <laughs> That's right. Really, I'm serious. All right, we're done. We don't have time for any more, but God bless you guys. We'll be in chapter three next Sunday night.